Hey everybody, so today we are going to be having a special guest on the channel, and that is Ian Horrocks, who is a professor at Oxford University, and he is also the co-founder of a great knowledge graph tool called RDF Fox, which I have done an honest review of, and it's up here if you want to go and check out that video after you watch this one. So today, Ian and I are going to be walking through something that I have kind of picked up on through my time in industry as someone who also has a PhD, and that is this weird stigma that sometimes can show up where, oh, you that's just very theory, that's very academic when you're in industry, and it kind of stinks when that happens to you. And if you aren't in industry yet and you are working on your master's or your PhD, this is something you might want to consider thinking about because you might actually face it in the workforce. Now, if you are someone that is trying to hire, I hope this video also encourages you to uh, rethink that stigma if you do have it, because people that have advanced degrees, yes, they are very academic, but that's not a bad thing. And we're going to talk about that with Ian in more detail. So if this sounds interesting to you, Keep on watching. I mean, in particular for things like built in functions and aggregation and, mm -hmm. you know, the actual just manipulating data like integers and yeah. strings and things yeah. is actually yeah. super important in real <laughs> applications. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? That, that, that could be <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it doesn't tend to be such a big focus of research, you know, because it's not like super interesting from a research point of view. In practice, well, in, in lab I mean, too. I mean, that has something to do with it as well. I mean, that's something that I've seen is. In, in the lab environment, um, and I say lab loosely here, of course, but, you know, in, in the more scholarly academic side of things, um, you are typically using, not always, but typically using data sets that are cleaner. They're kind of generated for learning, so they're not as messy or problematic as you might see in real life. I think that, that that's a very uh, good area to just even think about from um, if you are a student watching this video, um, the data sets you're using are um, maybe not as as uh, real true to form as you might see in real life. Well, yeah, I mean, to be honest, you know, from the sort of pragmatic point of view of a student, it just doesn't pay you to mess around with data sets like yeah. that. You know, you won't get your PhD by spending months and months implementing, you know, hundreds of different built-in functions yep. to deal with integers and, and strings and URIs yep. and dates and times. Nobody yep. really cares about that from, yep. you know, your PhD point of view. We know yep. you could do that. You know, you're a smart <laughs> guy or gal. You can yep. read the spec. You can implement yep. that. It's not really interesting. So there's no mileage for a student to do that. So the approach taken in academia is usually to, as you say, to take a sort of relatively simplified data set that okay. has you know some interesting features but mm -hmm. things that you can deal with that don't require you to put in a kind of mammoth engineering effort just to just to build the thing I'm talking to a lot of folks um that are are getting phds especially even master's degrees i would say this is true uh there is some sometimes that seduction to just continue to be a student forever that uh you just keep you know building out your problem statement and more data and more data and you you keep uh, doing it. The whole point of your degree is to learn things and to get your degree and then go do more things after that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's another reason you're not going to be dealing with gnarly data sets per se. Um, yes. and, uh, master's <laughs> and you have to be really careful not to get sucked into mm. believing that you're doing a lot by you know coding which is always a, a dangerous thing for a computer scientist you know yeah. we like coding you know yeah. we like building stuff and it yeah. makes us feel good and we get to the end of the day and we have you know so many lines more code and nice things you know that we can we can show but it's not necessarily getting you any closer to getting your phd which yeah. is the you know the business that you're in <laughs> at that point so right. I, I tend to you know advise my students to you know actually try to keep implementing as lightweight as possible yeah uh, it's yeah. just proof of concept stuff um yeah. that that's what you need yeah but, but then that's that's really interesting you know uh, to see what's required to go from that point to yeah. a product mm -hmm. and it, it's way more than I as you know an academic would ever have realized before yeah and I think that that's that's actually a great place to to maybe camp for a moment because I have discussed with a lot of, of people when I am hiring uh, that they have PhDs. And I've heard from other hiring managers that 
uh, maybe don't have a PhD that, oh, they're PhDs, they don't understand how things work in the real world, and they actually don't want to hire them. And I think to myself, well, wait a minute, a PhD doesn't just mean that you are, you know, an expert in that very niche thing that you focused on. It means you're also an expert at learning things very quickly, going from 30,000 foot level to the 30 foot level very quickly, your analytical skills, right? Like that's all part of getting a PhD as well. It's not just, oh, I know a lot about a topic. And um, that's the important part, actually. Yeah, that's why you're doing what you're doing. That's the difference between a master's degree and a PhD is you're learning a lot more of those analytical skills. You're no longer, um, you know, looking at everyone else's argument. You're making your own argument and you have to be able to support that with a lot of evidence and really pick apart other people's evidence. You know, if, if you're looking at it from a, a critical mindset. So that's the other thing that, you know, I just want to uh, encourage those that are watching this that are maybe looking at hiring and, and shying away from those with, with P, without PhDs for the, for the reason that you're talking about too is implementation is never going to be true to form when you're doing uh, your research and your, your academic because you're not dealing with legacy systems per se, unless you're doing maybe an internship or something like that. But when you get into real world scenarios, that's where you have so many additional uh, things that you have to deal with. And the way that you learned how to address things and solve problems in your your academics may not actually translate well uh, to what you're doing in real life. But that's where those analytical skills that you have come into play, right? Yeah. And to be fair, actually, some of the students I've known and other academics are actually brilliant coders i mm-hmm. mean just brilliant mm-hmm. it blows mm-hmm. me away what they can do and mm-hmm. and i mean part of the reason for that i think is just they're so damn smart you know they can do yeah. an yep. incredible amount in their head at the same yep. time because that's yep. one of the limiting factors with coding right you know the bigger the piece of the overall problem you yep. can really hold in your head and yep. really know every like nut and bolt in there it yep. sort of somehow increases the scale of the problem that you you know you're able to solve and the speed you're able yep. to work at because yep. you don't have to keep going oh, now what was that bit of code I wrote you know a few weeks ago mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. quite remember the detail mm-hmm. I'll have to go and just and but some of these guys they can hold you know just a huge amount in their and different methods speed. Right. Yeah, different I, think methods. I think that's that's really important, too, is is when you are going into the mindset of I am I'm writing this very large uh, piece of research. You have to really be confident in the method that you're using. But because this research is going on for over a few years, typically your method might have to change. You might have to pivot very quickly. And so you have to understand all of those those different methodologies or those different tools in your toolbox, as the business folks would say, you need to have that handy. And folks that have master's and PhDs usually do have a lot more that they can fall back on when they have to pivot very quickly. Yeah. And and they often understand really deeply what's going on, you know, so they understand how hash tables really work at the nitty gritty Mm -hmm. level and they know when that's going to be critical Mm -hmm. and when in some piece of code, you know, the standard library isn't really going to hack it because it's, you know, they, and then they really need to write their own highly optimized bit of code for that specific thing. Those are the kind of things they know and, and, you know, able to, to take care of. Yeah. And, and I, I love that you're focusing on that just because you are an academic doesn't mean you're not a doer. I've heard that a lot that folks say, oh, PhDs, master, anybody that's really, you know, at those accelerated levels of education, they don't make things. They don't create things. They only do research. It's all academic. And they almost say it like that's a bad thing that it's academic. And that just, just floors me because one thing that, that I, I know every PhD uh, can do is that synthesizing of many different approaches to something very quickly and then make it actionable, right? So, so even if in your day-to-day work, you're, you're doing uh, research, you're likely not looking at the sheer volume, I think, that a typical master's or PhD student is, is typically looking at. And that, I think, is, is kind of lost sometimes uh, when folks are talking. One of the things, if we pivot a little bit from what we're discussing about at the moment, because that was a good kind of segue you just yeah. uh, offered, which was this sort of attitude that people sometimes have to 
you know, academic and PhD, as you say, in a sort of negative way. Yeah. They, they say that pejoratively. Um, and, and, and theory is another thing. Oh, they're just, you know, it's all just theory. Mm-hmm. But actually, this is one of the things I, you know, talking about the, the sort of theory versus practice thing. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've come to believe in my sort of career as a computer scientist is that that it's a kind of it should be a continuum Mm -hmm. not one thing or the other Mm -hmm. you know actually we should start with some theory we should make sure we really actually understand what the problem is we're trying to solve and and the right sorts of methods for solving it but then you know we have to continue working our way towards practice which usually does involve some kind of pragmatic decisions I think that was another thing you mentioned at the beginning wasn't it pragmatism yes uh yeah it usually involves some pragmatic decisions but the the key thing is to do that as required and not just sort of either throw out the baby with the bathwater by at some point saying, you know, oh, uh, you know, the theory is just too, too messy. I'm just going to dive in and start, you know, hacking code. Or, yeah. or even the other thing I've seen often happens in computer science very broadly is people even start at the other end. The mm-hmm. first thing they do is start cutting some code, you know, it, yeah. and to be honest, it's actually really a bit of a sort of lazy approach <laughs> because it, it really is, you know, because yeah. that's what we like doing, right? Well, computer yeah. scientists, we know how to, we know how to hack code together, yeah. But, yeah. but thinking about hard problems and bashing our head against some, you know, nasty theory and reading textbooks and, oh, that really sucks and we hate doing that. <laughs> so there's a tendency to sort of, you know, not, not bother with that. Oh, I'm pretty yeah. sure I can somehow see in my yeah. head how this yeah. code should be written yeah. and, and then only later do we do we find it's not actually working right yeah and then we have to why is it not working and then we almost end up going backwards you know yeah. so then yeah. you have to sort of recreate well what algorithms did I really implement here let yeah. me think about that and then yeah. okay what was the problem did those algorithms really actually solve the problem you're, you're making more work for yourself and yeah, you know it's I, much harder I think that this is a really important er- area too because on the businessy side of things, people talk about, well, what were the lessons learned when you're doing a project? What you're talking about is, is very similar on the academic side too. The reason you're doing so much, uh, you know, starting at the beginning and not the end, as, as you're describing, the reason you want to do that is you learn from the mistakes. Oh, I tried this. It didn't actually work. Or I, I implemented the code in this way or put this parameter in and it didn't do what I te- intended it to do. If you just skip to the end and you just use whatever they did, you're not actually learning from all of their lessons throughout their research. And to your point, you're wasting a lot of effort and you're actually making it a longer process than it really needs to be. Yeah. And cycling back a little bit to what we were saying about PhDs and what Mm -hmm. you learn there, actually Mm -hmm. another really important skill you learn there is rapid prototyping and knowing how to quickly lash something together that may not be completely correct, but it'll kind of test the idea. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and knowing what sort of, you know, difficult, tricky, where the tricky bits are likely to be, making sure you kind of poke in on them really well to see that it doesn't all fall apart. And, And, you know, making sure that you figure that out as near the beginning as possible and not when you've already spent months and months you know mm-hmm. building this huge edifice that may yeah. all just come tumbling down into dust which you right. don't want right and I think that, that those are the things that you know in the workforce are going to be incredibly valuable is being able, able to iterate and stand something up quickly let it fall over learn from those things and then and keep chugging along I think and then another area that I would maybe encourage folks that are watching that maybe are thinking of doing, uh, you know, their master's or PhD or are currently doing it, don't skimp out on the, the, the business reasons, right? So if you can understand the why from a customer and business perspective, that's going to help you be a better computer scientist or a data scientist, whichever one you are, because you need to be able to always tie it back to why are you doing it? When you're in your academic field, you don't necessarily always have to think about that. It's, well, because I think it's interesting. I wanted to say, well, why does this work this way? And that is the beauty of, of doing some of your, your degree programs is you have the complete, complete freedom to just ask why and just do it because it's fascinating and nobody else has looked at it before. Yeah. When you get into the business side, you have to tie it back to the business. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it is incredibly useful, as you say, if you can identify some real business problem and actually hopefully some real business data that, yes. and some problem that something they're trying to do with that that doesn't work. 
Yeah. Or at least yeah. doesn't work as well as they'd like it to work. I mean, one of the things I wanted to mention about RDF Ox, if I can sort of, you know, move the yeah. conversation on a bit yeah. to RDF Ox. Yeah. You know, we, we actually started out with our research project where we tried to solve this problem via a different mechanism, which seemed sort of reasonably attractive at first. And that was one of these things. This was actually a sort of query rewriting approach. So basically, mm -hmm. you take the ontology, you try mm -hmm. to enlarge the query, rewrite the query, so as it kind of incorporates all of the knowledge from the ontology. And then you answer this enlarged query over the data sources. And, and the nice feature about that from a theoretical point of view is once you've rewritten it, you don't need the ontology anymore and the Ooh. data sources can even be, you know, mm -hmm. existing mm -hmm. relational databases mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it sounds really attractive in principle, yeah. Yeah. but it just sort of fell over in practice <laughs> due to the fact that the queries get pretty large mm -hmm. and they just kill existing oh. relational databases. Yeah. These queries yeah. are not the kind of query that relational databases were yeah. actually designed to, you know, to answer or optimize to answer. And, and also it was really difficult to extend them with these features as like you know built-in functions and numerical computations and all of mm -hmm. that stuff and the, and the project sort of failed in the end so it was a nice illustration of this kind of iterative approach you yeah. were describing when we went back to square one we decided okay we'll try the other approach which is materialization mm -hmm. so we take the ontology and we basically just instead of expanding the query we expand the graph so that the graph actually now includes everything that's sort of entailed by the ontology. Yeah. And then we'll answer sort of queries over the graph. Yeah. And, and, and we also realized that, you know, the downside of that is that what if the data changes? Mm -hmm. So, so we yeah. had to design from the get go with uh, incremental reasoning in mind. So we needed yeah. truth maintenance and stuff. Now mm -hmm. all of that stuff is hard. <laughs> algorithms yeah. you need for that are non-trivial yeah. and the data structures you need for that are non-trivial yeah. so we started with theory said okay what data structures do we need for that what algorithms do we need for that and we actually proved in theory that they were correct and then we built you know prototype systems we found issues we cycled around this loop a bit and incrementally if i can reuse that word you know made progress towards something that was a kind of close to being a completed system but it was still a kind of a research prototype yeah, yeah. and then we had to go through another two year three-year process to turn that into a product by adding all but of you the had more confidence stuff. in it at that point right because we had a lot of confidence right but you know one of the things I do see is that that gets better you know people in industry I think are more appreciative of PhD level education these days I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, much more appreciative than they were, yeah. you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and actually, most of the people getting PhDs coming out of my research group go into industry. You know, yeah. they don't, carry, some of them carry on in academia, yeah. but most mm -hmm. of them go into industry because, yeah. you know, there are such incredible opportunities out oh, there now. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, they've got all these big tech companies sort of fighting yeah. over them and offering them incredibly yeah. juicy salaries that, you know, <laughs> I, I, I look at that and I think I'm in the wrong business here. You, and, and I think that that's, that's, that's actually a, a really funny point. Um, you know, when I went for my, my PhD, I remember talking to a mentor of mine and she said, well, do you want to teach? Do you want to teach, you know, in academia? And I said, no, I want to continue because I was working full time while I got my PhD uh, in industry. And uh, I said, no, I don't want to leave industry. I want the opportunity to learn and explore and have those doors opened that you get when you are just learning for learning's sake. And she said, well, you know, I don't know if you should go for a PhD then. And I'm glad I didn't listen because I am an industry and a lot of the things that, that I have focused on, I don't think I would have had the opportunity to, if I hadn't gone for the PhD and, you know, having gone through the, the, um, the tribunal of, of standing in front of other experts and being able to confidently say why you are doing what you're doing. People ask me why I'm so confident when I talk to CEOs and CTOs. That's why if you sit in front of a, a bunch of Ians who are just brilliant scientists and you have to defend what you've done to them, it gives you some chops when you have to do that yeah. elsewhere. 
Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, you, you know, you know how to do that. You can defend your own position. And that's because you've learned how to develop that position, you know, mm -hmm. rationally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a defense at, at the ready. And I think it's also important to understand the place of the thing you're building in the mm -hmm. sort of overall For sure. sort of system. You know, if it's just some kind of end, you know, manipulation thingy that no too many other systems or maybe even no other systems are really relying on mm -hmm. then of course it's it's kind of less dangerous to yeah. flash something together worst case scenario you know you just throw it away at some point yeah. but if it you know the further back you get into the depths of the the sort of overall system that the mm -hmm. company's using the more important it is to avoid that because obviously you don't mm -hmm. want to get down the line and discover some really kind of core cool piece of machinery yep. that tons of other things are depending on yep. is kind of fundamentally broken. Uh, I, yeah. Bad. So uh, I know this firsthand. Make sure you ask. There's a lot of logical assumptions that, that we all can make in the workforce, but I have learned uh, the hard way. I'll always ask because things are not always logical in the workforce. <laughs> yeah. At least explicate your assumptions so that there's a chance that, you know, you or somebody else will notice at some point that exactly. this assumption is actually not correct. Exactly.